Suzanne takes you down to her place near the river. You can so here you and I are. We're doing these these little things right before us, whatever it happens to be. Each little thing we do every day is like a little blurp of oxygen. But the moment is coming when there's going to be this massive shift and then love is going to take hold and it's going to be at the center of our activities. That was Brian Swim, our guest for today's podcast. And you want to travel with her And you want to travel blind she will trust you. Hello, I'm Suzanne Taylor. Welcome to my podcast, Searching for Unity in Everything. How can we turn the world around? Can we turn the world around? Everything I've done has been in that pursuit, buoyed up by that famous quote by Margaret Mead, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. My guest today is Brian Swim. A mathematician by training, Brian Swim is a professor at the California Institute of Integral Studies in San Francisco, where he teaches evolutionary cosmology to graduate students in the Philosophy, Cosmology, and Consciousness program. He founded the Center for the Story of the Universe in 1989, and I quote, to expand our collective consciousness and redirect the current self destructive trajectory of society towards a vibrant community that transcends individual, human, and geopolitical boundaries. A mouthful. Among other DVD series he's produced and books he's authored and co-authored, I highly recommend listening to his 12-part DVD series, Canticle to the Cosmos. And my favorite book of his, The Universe is a Green Dragon, is my favorite book of anybody's. I'm of the opinion that if everyone read it, we would create the more beautiful world that our hearts know is possible. So, hello, Brian. I'm hello, so glad to be introducing you and your work to anyone who hasn't had the pleasure. So I thought we might start by your telling us what is a mathematical cosmologist? Well, this would be the area of science that is studying the birth of the universe, its development over time. There's a big discussion about whether or not the universe that we can observe empirically, if that's the whole of it or just a part of it. That, that would be the range of where mathematical cosmologists work. How did you manage to write a book that is so unusual? Did you have it all in mind? Did you outline it? Or did you just sit down, <laughs> start typing, and a book came out? If only. <laughs> well, it has that feel. Although it's very, very carefully organized, it has the feel that one thing evolves from another thing, you know? I can tell you exactly how it happened. I had discovered the work of Thomas Berry. Thomas was a cultural historian living in New York City, and I was a, a nervous assistant professor in Washington State, but he was so fantastic. I just had to find my way to him, and I did. I hauled Denise, my wife, and our two children to New York and basically entered into a conversation that lasted 30 years and until he died. The book flowed so easily. It was that I was taking in what Thomas Berry had to say. It was just fantastic. And then I was processing it through what I knew about the universe from studying it scientifically. It was just, you know, the most thrilling dialogue of my life. You know, I was worried about what he would think of the book because, it, you know, his language is very scholarly and it was beautiful. And I'm more, I don't know what to call myself. I, I mean, the, the best you can say is that I'm more poetic. And so I was worried that maybe he would, you know, be a little bit disappointed that it was kind of come down from his high, high, high level. But he loved it. He, just, he loved the book. And then I remember when um, about a year later, I was talking to him and I was telling him I was working on my second book and he just started laughing. He said, just forget it. You, there's nothing more to say. You're done. And it just, it, I thought it was hilarious. So, yeah. What is there to say after the universe is a green dragon? 
It's kind of interesting. So like you mentioned, after University of the Green Dragon, I kept at it. I, I just, I was trying so hard to tell people the story of the universe. And I did that, you know, for over 30 years. But then a question appeared in my mind, which still kind of makes me laugh. I asked myself this question, how has my mind changed during the 30 years of learning this story? I mean, I was a little kid. I ran around, I picked, you know, cherries and blackberries. I was just a fun little kid with freckles, right? And I was, I was raised inside of a, of a traditional Catholic home. And, you know, I was a West Coast American and a Democrat. This story blew up all of that. I actually, I want to catalog and tell how my mind changed. I think actually anyone who studies the story has his or her mind blown. It's just so amazing. And I think probably the changes we go through are what are required for us to get out of this horrendous situation we're in. I really mean that. I think the transformation of consciousness, it can happen a lot of different ways, right? Some people go into a Zen temple. Other people take psychedelics. Other people become nature lovers. There's a million ways. But one of them is to take in the fact of the evolving universe. So that's, that's what I'm working on, Suzanne. Yeah, you know, I get where the psychedelics would be the same thing. It's that you see the bigger picture. Earlier on in the book, I think it's in the in intro part of the book, you say, we're investigating the way humans will mature into their destiny as the human form of cosmic dynamics. The switch out of an attitude where the human is the center of everything, and here we are, this greedy universe, it's all ours, it's here to yeah. use, you know. <laughs> and here's a quote I really resonate to it. our scientific enterprise effectively decoupled itself from our humanistic spiritual traditions and you call it the most terrifying pathology in the history of humanity well that's pretty extreme language but well but, ain't it the truth yeah it really it turns out to be the truth a horrible horrible truth i mean yeah. we're not of the earth we're not you know beautiful natural creatures we're we're using the earth it's yeah. ours to you know yeah. to hurt you know it's a it's so really kind of a simple little and yet the most it, profound that's what thomas berry would say to the, the last two things you said the way he would characterize the mistake is that he he would say we have a use attitude toward everything we just think it's there for us to use he said you know the wisdom i have to offer is really simple it's just like you said, it's just, it's so simple and so obvious that gives me confidence that we're going to figure out how to do it because it's not that complicated. How do you think we're actually doing in the course of discovering or coming into this much more enlightened understanding? Then this Trump thing comes along and you're just shocked at how many people are in the dark. When Obama was elected, hate crimes rose. They really jumped. And, and I think in a sense, a lot of the people that ended up committing these crimes, horrible as they are, they wouldn't regard themselves as racist. Their own self-concept, for the most part, many of them, they wouldn't even think of themselves as racist. But these forces are powerfully present in our subconscious mind. So I think that what has to happen and what is happening is that the deep assumption of Western civilization and, and modern industrial society are being forced to the surface and we can see them. And so now we can take conscious action and not pretend we are all, we're just fine, we're fine. The, here's an example, I, I mentioned the hate crime, but here's another example, it's the same thing. The trash, the plastic trash that has surfaced in the Pacific Ocean is now as big as Russia. You know, so we're looking at our psyches are express themselves in this giant, giant trash heap. You see, I, I just feel like that's a necessary part of the transformation we're in. But in a way, it's helping us to change, to change the way we are. Do, do you have any ideas about moving that along, pushing it along? I have one insight. For what it's worth, we can be just destroyed by the way things are going. And we can end up catatonic and of no help to anybody. But I think it does help to see how the universe operates. I mean, this is a very strange situation. A couple examples. Our current understanding is that early in the universe, uh, there was a, um, a huge ocean of elementary particles. For every proton, there was an antiproton. 
because the energy in the early universe was so high, all of these particle pairs were brought forth. But when a proton interacts with an antiproton, it, they disappear into light. So there's a strange asymmetry at the beginning of the universe. It can be stated this way. For every billion plus one protons, the universe had a billion antiprotons. So there was this giant era of annihilation. So a billion plus one protons meet with a billion antiprotons and leave one proton. I mean, you know, it's just, it's one of the, okay, fine. The fact that it happened is, is amazing. But what I try to get across is this. The matter in the universe that we see is only a billionth of the original matter. It's only a billionth. And so the, this universe, for some reasons that are bizarre, this universe created all of this matter and then destroyed it. And there was a tiny little bit left. Now, here's the, here's the weird thing. The same thing happens with life. So here we are. It's 2019. And we have, you know, maybe 30 million species. Maybe we don't even know exactly how many we have. But we, you know, we, we still have a lot of species, even though they're going extinct. The species on the planet today represent less than 1% of the species that have come forth from the beginning of, of life on Earth. You see, so the, this is the way the universe operates. It creates all of these species, and then it demolishes them for a little tiny remnant to survive. And that's our planet today. So I, I just feel like we, we have to accept the fact that the universe is transforming now, and there's, there's a lot of annihilation. That for some reason, it seems necessary. And I try to cheer myself up and say, uh, okay, um, I don't like thinking about the species going extinct and so forth. What needs to be annihilated? So then I ask myself, what aspects of my psychology need to be annihilated? What aspects of my lifestyle? You see what I mean? I try to take it on myself and then and try to try to realize that even though a lot of these things I'm going to throw out, like a consumer lifestyle, okay, I'm going to throw that even though I'm going to throw out a lot of things, what remains will be a, a highly creative remnant of myself. Well, that's a very sophisticated, hopeful sign the, or hopeful analysis. Uh-oh, I hope human isn't part of what gets annihilated. Oh, dear. Thomas Barrett, on that point, I think it's interesting. He himself couldn't imagine the human species ever going extinct. But actually, I, I would like to just raise up the idea that every species, you know, goes extinct, but, but it has a gift to give to life. It has a gift. And so I think that, you know, who, who are we, right? And we try to think of ourselves as being consumers or Americans and, or Christians or whatever. These are all partial. We're, we're fundamentally cosmological beings. And if, if in this universe all species go extinct, by the way, the average mammalian species lasts 2.7 million years. Okay, so we have millions of years left. And the question is, what's the gift we're going to bring forth for life? I'm trying to put the universe as primary and then the human as derivative. Right now, we live in a world where everything is about serving humans. But wow, what if... What if we're in a, in a process that's so magnificent, it requires this, this incredible human species to give birth to something essential? Uh -oh. Well, actually, I do love the way you treat the idea of death in uh, the universe as a green dragon. It, it's one of the most beautiful chapters. You know, it's the only time I've ever actually read a rationale that lets me at least come to some acceptance. And it's where you talk about if life went on forever, if we were eternal, we wouldn't do very much. We just hang out. But when you know that it's uh, limited, it calls you to your best. It calls you to f perform yeah. and act and fill that short time with, with magnificence. So, Brian, were you always interested were you, as a child? What, what did you think you were going to be? You know, I'm embarrassed to say that um, I didn't think about the future a lot. I wish... I think it's 
important to, but I, I really didn't. I mean, I, what I did was I, I did respond to things. I, I mean, I just loved life and, and I, I was, I was struck by the stars and I just, you know, I was fascinated by the stars, but I didn't stop and say, wow, I'm going to, I'm going to be an astronomer. So I, I basically just pursued my deepest passions. And then I was in grad school at the University of Oregon. And, you know, my friends, they, they were all like doctors and lawyers and doing really, really well. And, and there weren't a lot of jobs for mathematicians. I was just struggling, you know, and I was wondering, how did I get here? How did, <laughs> why didn't I think about the future? And, you know, I mean, I remember the moment like it was yesterday. I, I glanced up and um, I saw the stars. That, and I realized that's what got me here was the beauty of the stars, you know. So I, um, I don't take responsibility for what I ended up as. I feel like I was ushered into it. You know, the one thing I didn't introduce you as was the wonderful human that you are. I introduced yeah. you by yeah. your work. But you, you're such a rare person, Brian. You just are. You mm. know, the world should be full of more Brian's. I don't oh, well, and more you. Suzanne's. I remember, uh, can I give my statement to the world? Yeah. Sure, yeah. That's, okay. a, you know, it's on my list here, so sure. Yeah. Because, so I thought about it for a while, you know, and I, because you prepared me and said, I want you to give a statement to the world. What would your statement to the world be? And I thought, I thought about it. I thought I tried different things out. And then I, and then I asked myself, well, what world am I talking to? And so if I'm talking to the world of listeners right now, I would say, isn't it wonderful to be in the sphere of influence of Suzanne, who, if we imitated her, we would transform the planet into a wonderful place. Now, I'm not saying you're the only one, but it's wonderful to think that if everyone were like you, we would just, you know, we would, we would be in paradise. Oh. I think, you know, in other words, wow, we're close. We're close to the big turnaround moment. Heaven knows I am dedicated to bringing it about, even though it is called megalomaniacal sometimes. What could it be that would get everybody, like for instance, if I can make everybody read your book, it would turn the world around. It's the way nature made things to be and we're so unnatural now. Can't there be something where everybody goes, oh yeah, you know? Let me give you a story that uh, relates to exactly what you're saying. Okay. Uh, Let me give you the moral of the story before I even tell it. And that is that I think we we have the, the thing to do right in front of us and we need a sense of the larger dimension of what we're about. Simultaneously, we need both, right? The story I love, it's one of the, one of the greatest in evolutionary biology. The, the organisms, prokaryotes, they figured out how to get hydrogen from water. So the, all of the organic compounds need hydrogen. They needed to find it. And it, it's hard. You got to break a bond. And then, but they figured it out. And so then they started to draw in the hydrogen from the water by breaking apart the molecule. And then they released the oxygen into the atmosphere. So when they started to do this, the percent of oxygen in the atmosphere was less than 1%. And so they kept at it, kept at it. You can imagine a little tiny prokaryote breaking apart a little molecule and a little bubble of oxygen is released, right? This went on, this went on, this went on. And then it got to... And I don't know the exact percentage. Or the percentage now is 20.9%, all right? Just say 21% oxygen. But it crossed a threshold, and that enabled complex animals and minds to come forth. And that's what enabled it, Suzanne. So here you and I are. We're doing these, these little things right before us, whatever it happens to be. Each little thing we do every day is like a little blurp of oxygen. But the moment is coming when there's going to be this massive shift. And then love is going to take hold. And it's going to be at the center of our activities. That's you and I can thing. feel that. We can feel that. Oh, it's just sweet to be talking to you like this. It makes you feel better to talk about the, the good that could, you know, and that should. Yeah. I want to just read one little other thing that you're quoted on frequently. It's the greatest discovery of the scientific enterprise. And you say, you take hydrogen gas and you leave it alone and it turns into rose bushes, giraffes, and humans. That may be a case of retro causality. 
there's some indication, some physicists are convinced that the future actually is acting on us right now. Well, yeah, you know, being a crop circle girl, some of the stories that you try to see beyond the material world is maybe it's the future coming back. Is there anything lately that you've learned that is, you know, added to your body of knowledge? I have a friend whose name is Ben Kassira, and he came to me and we had a conversation. You'd love him. He said, um, Brian, you know, I, I really love Journey of the Universe. I, you know, I just, I really, really love it. But you end it without telling us anything about the future. You, you talk about the whole vast universe and all that's happened. But, you know, we need a vision of the future. And so that's what I'm working on now. One of the great visionaries is Pierre Teilhard de Chardin. His vision of the future was, he called it the noosphere. And, it's, and again, it's very simple, but it, it's so compelling that we had, we had a, a molten planet, and then it, it gave rise to the atmosphere, which gave rise to the hydrosphere, the oceans, which gave rise to the biosphere, life. And right now, we're in that moment when it's giving rise to the planetary mind, what he uh -huh. called the noosphere, the planetary mind. It's amazing the way human thought is now envelops the planet. So that is my great passion is to understand this and explore it. That sounds like you're dabbling in your mission, yes? Yeah, I would say the, the simple way of saying my mission is to say that I'm on a mission to teach humans that we are a 14 billion year creative process. That's what we are in a primary sense. I mean, we also are you know, male, female, all the rest of it. But those are secondary. Those are secondary. Every, every person, every animal, every rock, everything is a mode of a 14 billion year creative process. That's my mission. Yeah, right. to have people understand that. Yeah. Fingers crossed that your next book will be as good as The Universe is a Green Dragon. <laughs> no chance. You know, good thoughts about that because okay. you, do, you write like nobody else does. So may the next book be an even more compelling and popular work. And we really all have that to greatly look forward to. Thank you, Suzanne. That means a lot to me. I really, really appreciate it. Well, I thank you so much, Brian. I hope we've done justice to you, you know, <laughs> really. I, I always feel like, oh my gosh, if I could do justice to Brian, I will have fulfilled yeah, my destiny. That's it. my whole message is right here. That's well, 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 well done. Thank you. Well, thank you, honey. Suzanne takes your hand and she leads you to the river. So, dear listeners, thank you for tuning in to this episode of Searching for Unity in Everything. Do subscribe to our podcast so you don't miss any episodes. And check out suespeaks.org slash podcast for notes about this one. To make any comments on it, go to our blog on suespeaks.org where we made a post about this episode. How did you feel about what you heard? Did you learn anything? Or were you inspired to act in any new way? Or do you perhaps disagree with anything that was said? Also, while you're on our website, do explore and comment on some of the other content. There's a cup of consciousness for everyone. And you want to travel with her And you want to travel blind you can trust her, for she's touched your perfect body with her mind.